How's it going folks? Welcome to Found Flicks. On today's Ending Explained, we're looking at the latest from the maestro of twist, M. Night Shyamalan's Owl. We follow a group on a tropical holiday who discover that the secluded beach they are relaxing at is somehow causing them to age rapidly, reducing their entire lives into a single day. So anyone that's followed Shyamalan's career knows that it's had some definite highs and lows. You know, I didn't even see his Avatar movie once. After Earth, uh, no siree. After these back-to-back -back blockbuster duds, Knight went back to his roots in the self-funded return to form The Visit. It has been pretty solid ever since, although I wasn't too crazy about Glass either. I'm glad to say that at least for me, Old was a successful if somewhat unmemorable outing for the director. It's got a more solid than average cast who do give some memorable performances, and I really dug the actual way the scenes were constructed. Everything is pretty much set on a beach, but they use the camera in several long long takes zipping around our characters and this keeps the suspense high throughout. It almost feels staged like a theatrical setup which actually works for me really well. I also like the kind of underlying theme of the movie on top of the inevitable quicker than usual march towards death. There's a through line of learning to appreciate and live in every moment as it will be over before you know it. Especially when you know you'll be dead in like less than a day. Better figure your shit out quick dude. And yes it does have a juicy twist at the end, there's the main question looming over the characters throughout. What or who is behind this strange beach and what's the point? I guess the graphic novel this was based on leaves things ambiguous in this regard, but in a way that is a bit out of character for Knight, this really makes it clear what is going on. Regardless, never fear because I am here to help break down the many mysteries of the island and just who is behind this whole nefarious setup. So let's take a lovely tropical vacation to a beach of death in Old, breaking down the story and its themes, along with explaining our big twist and the ending. Our vacationing family, Guy and Prisca, along with their kids 11-year-old Maddox and 6-year-old Trent, seem very excited and all smiles as they make their way to their fancy pants resort. When Trent asks about scuba diving, Mom encourages them to look out the window and really take in the moment. Kind of our whole theme of the movie here, like I was saying, yet she immediately appears distracted, shrugging it off to Guy as just being work stuff, but that is not the case as we come to learn. They're warmly greeted by the resort man manager, welcoming them to their own little version of paradise. The parents are immediately handed some specialty cocktails, said to be based on their provided preference sheets. As for the kids, there's a candy station that's open 24 hours a day. Well, that is pretty exciting. Another shy kid, Idlib, suggests to mix them all together. And he is an expert on the matter, as we find out his uncle is the resort manager here. He and Trent become fast friends, him boasting of his 42-strong conch shell collection. Amazing, Trent beams. Back in the room, the kids are excited to hit the beach, but mom is looking distant again. Guy reads a pamphlet that mentions a company Warren and Warren. He knows all about it from his work. We'll find out they're very important. The kids hang out on the beach, going around to strangers and asking their names and occupations, which is kind of awkward. Later things bubble over with the parents, and as they argued, find out they were already on the path to getting separated. Yet things were made much more complicated when Prisco learned that she has a tumor. She pleads for them to just get through this vacation before telling the kids. He grows emotional, groaning to come on, and she shouts back that he only thinks about the future. Gotta live in the moment, guy. The kids overhear the whole heated exchange, clutching each other right outside the door. Well, so much for keeping any secrets at this point. At breakfast, the manager approaches the family with a special invitation. He tells them of a private beach that is only allowed to certain guests, but since they're such a nice family, he's offered it to them. He describes it as a natural anomaly, a once in a lifetime experience, he says, and with a pitch like that, you'd be crazy to turn it down, right? A woman, Patricia, suddenly falls, taken over by a seizure, her husband, Jaren, holding her helplessly. Luckily, another guest, Charles, is a doctor, giving him the sage-like advice of to just leave her here, she'll be fine. Wow, thanks doc. In their brief exchange, Charles has somehow already forgotten Jaren's name, indicating to us that he must be having some kind of mental decay related issues. It's appropriately M. Knight himself acting as a bus driver that loads up the gang to their destination. He stops to unlock a gate marked with no admittance signs and leaves them with a big mass of food. When asked for help to get their bags to the beach, he's all, eh, I gotta go, just get through that slot canyon and it's right there before hopping in the van and speeding off. Later suckers! They arrive at the beach and it is admittedly quite breathtaking, Prisca even getting chills at its majesty. Charlie is annoyed with the kids nearby so he sets up further down the beach and his wife Crystal gets right to work taking some selfies, him annoyingly looking on. The parents have another scuffle that illustrates their further
they're drifting apart. She asks coyly what book she's reading, and he has no idea, and says that he has something that he wants to tell her, but brushes it off for later. Well, it's not gonna be much of a later. There's already another surprise visitor on the beach, a rapper hilariously known as Midsize Sedan. Maddox can't help but flip out upon seeing him, but Guy asks her to keep her distance. He's on vacation too, you know. They play freeze tag with Charles's kid Kara, her stopping in place when getting tagged. Again, you gotta freeze that moment in life in your mind, because it's over before you know it. They're all suddenly starving and raid the picnic basket. After scarfing down, it's time for some hide and seek, Trent noticing oddly that there's no fish whatsoever in the water. Even more alarmingly, a dead body floats up behind him to his surprise, sending him fleeing to his mom. The body then washes up on the beach, everyone in shock at the sight, and Midsize defends himself that he's got nothing to say, while Crystal moans that they should have gotten a private yacht. Now they're tied up in some kind of island issue. Those issues are about to ramp up a lot more, as Prisca notices that Trent's suit has grown tight, as though he's growing bigger. Charles returns with word that there's no cell phone signal, calling the beach day over, as they're joined by another couple, Patricia and Jaren. The others hurry to catch the bus back, but a confused Jaren says, wow, they already left. Already, Charles is showing more signs of his illness, somehow thinking Midsize was responsible for killing the woman, seeing that his nose is bleeding. Jaren assumes that they must have signal, because how else would they know to pick them up? Yeah, well, maybe they don't want to pick you up, and gallivants right back into the cave. He's suddenly overwhelmed by a strange pressure and blacks out, waking up back on the beach. Prisca runs up worried about her son, but Charles is preoccupied with his mom, who has suddenly stopped breathing. He attempts to resuscitate her to no avail. Charles crying that she must have been in shock and simply couldn't take it. Elsewhere, the siblings chat off screen with the couple, who guess that Trent is aged 11, but he corrects that he's only six. They assume that it must be some kind of joke. As Prisca comes up asking about her kids' whereabouts. She's shocked and scared, taking in their new appearances as they have grown years in mere minutes. Guy runs up after and is also taken aback by his kids aging up. Maddox giving him a confused hug, assuring him, it's me, daddy. Midsides bolts for the cave and Charles chases after, but soon they are both taken over by the same effect and then gasp back to consciousness on the beach. Looks like that ain't gonna work to get out of here. Doc describes feeling an intense cranial pressure as though he was underwater, but insists that he's fine. Growing concerned about being able to get out of here, they decide to split up to find another way off the beach and break into groups in case they black out. Later, everyone wakes up grabbing their heads in discomfort. Well, again, that is not gonna work, huh? It's starting to look like this mysterious rock wall around the beach acts as a kind of barrier for the area. The parents assume what's happening must be some kind of reaction to the food and again seek Charles's input, but he's growing more unhinged. He retrieves a pocket knife and starts slicing at Midsize's face. He immediately says he doesn't know why he did it and apologizes, but Midsize is pissed, calling this an assault. Well, that's true. Jaren asks to see the wound, and they notice that it's all healed up already, only a scar left behind to everyone's befuddlement. They dig into more personal details, and start sounding like these strangers do have something in common. Many of them are ill in some way. The girl he was with had MS, but swam out into the water like she was freaking Michael Phelps, and says that he's sick with a rare problem with blood clots as we piece together. Together. Plus, we have Prisca and her tumor, Patricia and her seizures, and Charles is on said dementia. Everyone's got a variety of issues here. The kids, too, start freaking after Charles guesses their age is at much higher than they came to the beach at. And the rapid aging also affects dogs, too. Someone yelling out that it's died. Looking out into the waves, Jaren lays out the possibility of someone swimming to get them help, yet no one volunteers. Elsewhere, Maddox struggles with her sudden development, saying that she feels different and her thoughts have more colors in them. Yesterday, she had a few strong colors, now there's many more, but they're quieter. They then start figuring out the illness connection, just as Prisca gets weak and faints. Her tumor has grown visibly much larger, and so they decide to try and remove it, getting ready for a makeshift beach surgery. Well, hopefully you don't get any sand in there. About to make the first cut, Charles is distracted, trying to remember a movie with Brando and Nicholson. Now is not the time for that, dude. When asking if he's okay, he bristles to just let me do my job. Naturally, the incision heals itself quickly, so they try again, with the others holding the wound open long enough to be able to remove the tumor. It takes some effort to get it loose, Charles chuckling that it's the size of a cantaloupe. Yeah, hilarious, I guess. Briska soon flutters awake, saying that she's feeling much better, and they praise her husband's fast decision for saving her life. She still loves her. Midsize is back at the woman's body and lifts the towels, looking shocked. The others all rush over, seeing there's only bones left. According to Priska, it should take about seven years for flesh to rise 
rod from bones, but it has happened in three hours. Less than two hours after we die here, we turn to dust. Darren starts finally figuring out something is going on with time on the beach. Yeah, you think? The kids are already older again and more mature. Trent in a tent with Kara, but we don't quite make out what's happening. The others determined that 30 minutes on the island is the equivalent of one year of life outside. This explains why the kids are needing so much food. Their mass is growing quickly. For the adults, their mass stays the same, but the cells themselves are still aging. So by the math, one day equals 50 years, meaning only the kids will be able to survive the full day. And as for the cave, they consider that it's similar to when a swimmer comes to the surface too quickly. You can't reacclimate, so your body simply goes unconscious. Kara stops off to gobble down some more food, and again the others stare on at a new shocking development. The two strut up, Kara appearing several months pregnant. Uh-oh, getting frisky in the tent. Trent with a big old grin on his face. They innocently say they were just playing, and Charles is back to rambling about that movie. Jaren determines, based on their appearances, that she's about five months pregnant. But here, that's a mere 20 minutes from conception. They order her to lay down on the blanket, knowing the baby will be coming soon. Trent is naive and confused about all this, thinking that you had to do it 10 times or something to get someone pregnant, showing that while physically aging, that doesn't apply to his knowledge as well, because that's something a dumbass kid would say. Everyone pausing when they hear the newborn crying. There's a moment of relief that instantly dissipates as the sounds go quiet and they know the baby is already gone. As Crystal complains to Charlie that he's supposed to protect us and he failed, he calmly asks for a second and starts randomly violently stabbing the ground. He turns his ire to Jaren, who tries to bring him back to reality. Charles babbling on about thinking that he was trying to break into his house for some reason, and he coldly tells Crystal to put some makeup on her face, hiding it in horror. Oh God, not wrinkles! The kids find her distraught, and she recounts a weird story about an old love of hers named Giuseppe. She felt she was too attractive for him, and so she left him, but she's been thinking about him a lot more here. They're then drawn away by Patricia shrieking, seeing Charles has gone fully off the rails, brutally stabbing mid-sized sedan. Everyone runs up to his aid, but it is too late, and the killer simply wanders off towards the cave. Just like everything else too, his brain is deteriorating at a rapid rate. They then spot someone definitely watching them from up above on a hill, and Guy gets the knife away from Charles, promising the others everything will be okay. Jaren bravely and foolishly decides to navigate the waters as Patricia needs her medicine. Luckily, she hasn't had a seizure for several hours, but he knows that is bound to change soon. He's certain that he'll make it and sats out into the waves, and I'm all, yeah, we are never gonna see this dude again. Well, maybe his bloated body in a minute. The group discuss just how they ended up here in the first place, and Patricia recalls a random sweepstakes that she entered, but Guy remembers more, that they know way more about them personally than they should. They must have been chosen due to their conditions. Even getting here, they realize it was always in a special car or plane, all made to cover their tracks and to make it look like the families never even left their homes. We're now getting just how much in control of things the people behind this supposed experiment really are. It's like they know they're going to die probably, so they can't have word of that getting out. Erase the whole thing. It's the only way. The hidden truth finally comes out between Prisca and Maddox. She admits they were going to be getting divorced and that there is someone else in the picture. For her, things changed when she got the tumor. She spends her days looking at old remains and started thinking sometime soon she would end up just like them. However, she says she feels different today. What she did then feels like an illusion. She assumes after this that her daughter hates her now, but with tears in her eyes, Maddox just asks for more time and stomps off. Well, time is kind of the one thing they don't have at the moment. Maddox tries to give herself a pep talk, struggling with her changing body. She's got to be an adult now and be stronger for everyone. She sulks off into the water and lets the waves crash over her as she begins to sob. Her introspection is interrupted by a body floating up, and it's Jaren, of course. The others are growing more and more hopeless, and Kara in particular is becoming mournful of their lost time. There's so many memories that they didn't get to have, moaning that it's not fair. Trent tells her that the dead baby needs to rest now, and takes the bundle away, burying it in the sand. Ultimately, Kara decides to attempt to scale the rock wall, futilely doing anything she can to get off this beach. The others plead with her to come down, but after she makes it pretty high up there, they start thinking that she might just have a chance after all. Starting to approach the ledge above, she suddenly stops moving to everyone's horror, knowing that she's starting to black out. Trent yells for her to wake up, and she plummets off the side, smashing right into the sand. But don't worry, Patricia has a great plan, seeing her set up with some floating noodles bound together. She convinces herself that she has to go for her 
sister, realizing that she's actually the older sibling now, and remembers something about them fighting, which to her now all seems so ridiculous. Before she can even set out, she's overtaken by a violent seizure. They almost consider asking for Charles' help, but know that he is way too far gone at this point. And just like that, she's gone. The remaining adults start showing their age as well. Guy's eyesight goes almost completely blurry, and Prisca discovers that she's going deaf in one ear. Knowing their time is growing short, Guy revisits what he wanted to discuss with his wife earlier. He saw a text between her and her new beau. He's not exactly thrilled by it, but he's even more perturbed that she settled for that guy, as he calls him a pretend person, saying that she deserves better than that. He admits that the real problem here is that he's a coward and hides from everything. She argues, on the other hand, that this is all entirely her fault and responsibility. Any anger should be directed at her and only her. Well, hey, finally clearing the air. That's good. After this, they seem more at peace with each other, both agreeing that they want to be here, right here, right now. They can still appreciate each other and enjoy each moment before it's all over. The kids find what must have been a journal from a previous person on the beach who made notes trying to figure out what was going on. He concluded at least that the spot is magnetic and was once submerged beneath the ocean. The rocks have mineral deposits and that must be what's responsible for causing cells to age at a rapid rate. And they also wonder how in the world did they find the place initially. They see someone again watching over them with a camera and know they're recording them, but why? The parents are sitting on the beach and Charles is back to cause more trouble. He rants insanely about people breaking in and starts slashing at Guy with his knife. Frisca steps in to defend him and gets a few stabs in the back. Hey, they're standing up for each other now. It's love. He pushes her away and she warns the kids to go and hide. In the cave, they hear odd grunts and come to Crystal looming in the darkness and groaning that her body hurts to move. When lighting a match, we can almost make out her twisted body. Her screaming, don't look at me! Maddox realizes that her body rapidly healed from her own ailment, but unfortunately all of her bones healed back in the wrong position. She attempts to crawl painfully, but it is too much, seeing her all pretzeled up, limbs in distorted positions, and she's a goner. Well, that was definitely messed up. Back on the beach, Prisca surprises Charles with another knife, one that's rusted, noticing that the wound this time does not heal. She informs him that it acts like poison in the bloodstream. It quickly spreads throughout his entire body, and she apologizes that it was either him or her family. He collapses, gurgling and choking, until he brutally dies. The kids rejoin their now feeble parents at the beach, and in a flip from even earlier today, they are now tasked with taking care of them. Maddox starts singing, and her mom gets in close, smiling. Guy's mind begins to fade away, confused if they were fighting about something. She tells him that they were, and he grumbles, whatever it was, he's not mad anymore. He chuckles, telling her it's funny. He forgot the word that describes his feelings about her. She smiles back, I know, and the family gathers together one last time. Soon after, Guy passes, and Prisca shakily gets to her feet, spending her last moments walking towards the water. In the morning, only the kids remain and are now aged up to maybe in their 50s. Maddox somberly notes that they probably only have 13 or so hours left. Her brother takes the moment to touch her face, her laughing that she just got three days older in that one little moment. They agree to keep trying to get out of here, but first, take time to build a sandcastle together, again living in that moment and appreciating the time they still have. She wonders if everybody feels like a kid at their age, or is it because they were literally children yesterday? Well, that's a tough one to decipher. Trent remembers a message from Idlib that he never decoded, and she encourages him to do so. He reveals the message to her. My uncle doesn't like the coral, it reads. They then remember a bank of it off the shore nearby, and think that it's possible that it can protect them from the rock's effects. Maybe the boy heard people were being taken to the beach. He might not have completely gotten the full picture of what was going on, but knew somehow it was bad, believing that Idlib is in fact trying to help them. Holding hands, they set off into the water, coming across the spiky coral lining the ocean floor. Underneath, there's a tunnel to swim through, completely surrounded in the stuff. Maddox's shirt gets caught on the coral, and Trent sets back to help her. Some time passes, and M. Knight stares intently at the still water, seeing nothing. He assumes that they've drowned, and informs the main base as such. They're a little worried about having another incident, but he reminds them that the last person that got through drowned. He's confident they're gone, and concludes that trial 73 
three is complete, meaning that this is the 73rd iteration of this experiment of sorts, and that most likely every time ended in everyone's death. He strolls up to a bunker hidden amongst the trees, and it is a pretty serious setup inside with lab coats all over the place. A TV displays facts about various diseases as people are seen experimenting with samples and test tubes along with different plants. It looks like the cocktails actually. Enclosed in a high security case is what appears to be a piece of the rock from the beach, assumingly the entire reason behind this nefarious research. Another guy gets to work deleting these subjects and scrubs them completely, that way no one can ever find out what happened to them. The resort manager, who it turns out is also in charge of this group, addresses all the others and asks for a moment of silence for the members of Trial 73. He confirms the inspiration behind all this is the beach and its strange particular properties. It's thanks to their work done here that they've been able to save hundreds of thousands of lives due to new medicine developed on the island. Well, that is pretty impressive. He admits that the trials fail constantly, but not today, as they were able to actually help one person in the group, Patricia, who had seizures. The medicine they gave her actually worked as she didn't have a seizure for eight and a half hours, or 16 years in the time in the rest of the world. The tincture is already being fast-tracked into production, everyone bursting into applause. He continues on in support of their grander purpose here. Nature made this place for a reason, and Warren and Warren, the pharmaceutical company mentioned earlier, were meant to find it. There's a lot more work to be done, he says. It's time to do what nature wanted us to do, leading to even more rapturous applause. So now we get with absolute certainty that the whole resort and beach setup is really all a ruse to get unwilling participants here for further experiments. Sure, they are doing helpful work that will benefit others, but of course, most of the subjects involved wind up dead. Does that make it worth it? And there are some other issues with how things are done. Even if they just ask people like, are you sick? Do you want to come and maybe get some experimental cures? You might end up dying, but you're probably going to die anyway. So what's the problem? You know, you get some free drugs out of it. Another guy brings up at the very least, they should be separating the pure medical illnesses from the mental ones. Thanks to Charles going nuts, they lost data on blood clot research as a result of midsides getting murdered. The manager agrees to let him put in a word to the big boys, but I would wager they don't give a shit. They just want to make more drugs and the leave more money, how they get there is unimportant. I mean, the whole setup here indicates they clearly don't care about the people who are fueling their experiments. Back at the resort, little Idlib is at the candy station looking down in the dumps. His uncle sweeps his old friend away. They went home and don't matter. I tell you who to play with, and he points out some other kids saying that he can play with them. Someone off screen approaches a guy out relaxing, who little Trent spoke with earlier, his whole name and occupation thing, remembering that this guy is a police officer. He is a bit confused but is still willing to take a journal from the man, obviously Trent, that he hands over. Fresh faces arrive at the resort, and the manager is there to greet them just as with our initial family. Madrid steps out with drinks for them, and someone bumps into her, spilling them all over the ground. It's an unruly Trent, warning to not take anything they give you. Based on what we have seen, these cocktails are in fact experimental medicinal cocktails tailored to potentially cure their particular ailments. That's how they give them the dose in the first place, through those cocktails. The cop is already on the phone, looking into a list of names from the journal and learns that three of them are all missing. With this, he sends over a photo of the rest of the names, looking like the experiment is going to soon come to a crashing halt. Idlib comes out looking confused at his friend's aged face, but it all comes together when Trent shows him the code. The manager is absolutely losing it, yelling that they need to solve this now. We go back to the water at that moment. With fresh determination, Trent gets his sister free and they reach the other side away from those pesky aging minerals. They know for sure they're safe when seeing a school of fish beginning to gather around them. Again, there were no fish at the Magic Beach, as young Trent pointed out. Flying over the area in a helicopter with a cop, he fills us in that these mad experiments are indeed done for good. Everyone is being arrested, and papers are being served to the head honchos at Warren and Warren. Well, they're screwed. He says their aunt is waiting for them, asking how she thinks she'll take all this. Trent tries to wrap his mind around the idea of a 50-year-old man saying that he's her six-year-old nephew, but Maddox is hopeful to be okay. The group fly away from the beach once and for all. That brings us to the conclusion of this ending explain on old. Hey, you know, make sure to appreciate every moment in your life because you can't get it back. You cannot turn back time. So don't get wrapped up in petty bullshit. It's no good for anybody. And don't forget, before we go, you can send me requests for any movies or TV shows you'd like to see me explain by sending them my way on any of my social media accounts at Foundflix. What did you guys think of old and its ending? What's your favorite Shyamalan joint? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Found Flicks. See you next time.